Wild Times bonus pod. Peter's still doing the thing. Patrick's yep. still wearing the same outfit he's been wearing for Woo! three weeks straight, his winter yep. look. Uh, it's because it looks amazing. It it's does 90, look nice. by the way. So. <laughs> it's Dude, really so hot, hot out, out today. It's I was so, sunbathing. It's unpleasant. You were yeah. sunbathing. You are on. so pasty. How is that possible? I mean, the tan doesn't come right away, gentlemen. It but takes a little the, bit. The burn but does. Look, look at Forrest and I. Yeah. We mm-hmm. look like we've seen the sun. You <laughs> look like a newborn I just have, fish. I have good, I have good lighting. I, I put my makeup on today. I don't want to okay. blemish. Gotcha. Smart. Uh, Smart. We got a fun bonus this? today. Huh? Oh, you joined, oh, you got I your water bottle. Your you advice. Joined, you joined the uh, the Mark Dev Water Bottle Club. All right. Yes. I dig we it. Gotta, Patrick's going to get it. We, we got to start selling these on on our for as merch with our own custom. Like fucking Dude, that's levels. a really good idea. Did you hear that, Patrick? You might have been yeah, grabbing yours. Smart. Merch with ours, it's like seven seven Ooh, a.m. Beat off. Yeah, you know, like some some really good goals for your day on your water bottle. <laughs> Just uh, real bro-y cool. shit. And yeah. then of course, here's the thing. I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. Please. We're gonna launch our own wild times. You know, keep track of your water consumption bottle. It's yeah. gonna be the rage. It's going to go all over the world. If I know our brosners, and I think I do, they're going to start filling it with all sorts of alcohol. Right, right, right. <laughs> Someone's going to choke on their own vomit. We're yep. going to get sued. Yeah. And it's 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 all over. So let's that not even do it. it. Let's stop before we start. I agree. That's <laughs> yeah. smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, people do know who we are, but I really derailed it already. Should probably introduce the what the fuck this we're the doing. This is the bonus, dum dum. We don't do that. I know. On the bonus. I know, but they still deserve an introduction. Don't I don't know what you are talking about. We've what is wrong with you, that. Peter? We've never done an introduction about? on a bonus before. We ever. always say hello like it's the bonus pod. You fuckers know who we are. We don't need to do that whole thing. I just I feel like we kind of just rambled our way right into Did the beginning. Did you black out for the first three minutes of this podcast? Were you not here? Yeah, you Did played I, the jingle, you danced. We did. That's all we do, man. That's all we do. That's all we've ever done. I, I'll, I'm going to derail enough. it even further. Please. I saw a friend, a friend last night who was uh, just plowing through the wild times. And she said that uh, Ratep said something so funny on her drive over that she like swerved into the other lane and spit out her drink. <laughs> that, dude, that's the the. Can I tell you what the, what the joke was? Oh yeah, I yeah, didn't but, realize that. Oh that, yeah, that yeah I didn't know you knew it. That piece of information. Yeah. Forrest was talking about something, and he said, "Yeah, I'm for it." And then Peter goes, "No, you're Forrest." <laughs> <laughs> It's a pretty good joke, actually. It is. A it is. Good it is. Joke. And it's I'm the subtle perfect combo of like cheesy dad joke, wit, and uh, dude. I, I'm scared for when my my brain synapses start just not firing as as quickly, and I'm when I'm no longer starts, funny. Huh? I'm gonna be useless. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Yeah, yeah, you're a ways away from that happening. Um, no, listen, maybe. I I got a Brosner DM, and I, I I'm not gonna lie. I deleted it immediately and pretended I never got it because I was so ashamed of it. <laughs> But I think we should address it. It was a it was okay. a, it was a Brosner DM that was like, "Hey, Forrest, like big fan. Like you guys are awesome. Listen to the Wild Times. You know, you 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 like you insulted me into starting over when I tuned in on like episode number seventy three or something like that. Really flattering. And then towards you know about halfway through the bro the DM, he goes, "But there's one thing I got to talk to you about." And he hits send and then leaves it. Right. And I'm like, okay. So I leave him on red. Don't respond because I'm like, he didn't he didn't write back. And then, uh, for some reason, I just happen to be looking at my phone as these were coming in. Five minutes go by, and another lengthy DM comes in. And Mm. that lengthy DM is like, listen, you're really funny. Patrick's really funny. I get that you guys have a longstanding relationship, but you guys have to stop bullying Peter. Like, this is not fun to watch. Like, I really act like starting to upset me. Like, he tries so hard, and I understand that he's, like, not on your guys' level of knowledge, but, like, the way that you treat him. (laughs) And it just, like, it kept going. And I'm, like, reading it, getting more and more sad. I'm like, delete, 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 delete. I don't want to read the rest of this. <laughs> and pretend it never happened. But, uh, yeah, I figured I'm, we should address it. The people like me. The the people, you, I mean, Forrest, you're a likable TV character. Pat, you're incredibly unlikable <laughs> as a character Now who's on getting camera. bullied? Yeah, now but who's getting bullied? I will bully. say. I, you know, I'm just like, I'm more likable than you two. You know, that's that's just the way that it is. You call me meager. Okay, it, it, I don't even care about this. Meager? Here's the re- here's the main response. Yeah. The biggest podcast of all time prior to Joe Rogan becoming the biggest 
was the Ricky Gervais podcast, which okay. was literally Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant sitting in a room yeah. Yeah. bullying Carl Pilkington. Right. The, 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 the sports pod- guy, right? Yeah. yeah. The sports podcast I listened to. They do one a month where they just have their idiot friend on and bully him. And it's by far their most viewed podcast every month. So yeah. I think there's a lot of people well, who like this dynamic. A couple, I do a couple too. of things. I do too. Number I don't one, think that it. Go ahead. Go ahead. N- number yeah. one, you're not Shut Ricky up. Gervais. So let's just get that out of the way. And I'm then much he, thinner than him. He is much maybe, thinner than Ricky Gervais. <laughs> may, maybe the, it's good in small doses, like once a month. But when it's every podcast, come on. Just, by they the way, don't I, don't, you. They I don't. I don't understand. Even fucking notice hey, it. P- I don't Patrick, even notice it anymore. Can I point anymore. something out? One, he doesn't notice it. He never has. And two, <laughs> they have no idea how much he bullies us off air. Like he's sweet, lovable Peter. If, when the podcast I, times is yeah. rolling, the okay, second yep, okay. the camera goes down, it's like, yeah. hey, you dumb fucks! Like, how come you haven't responded to this right. email? How do you yep, shitheads yep. not know how to operate an eye calendar? Yep. Like that is true. Ebully, ebully, yeah. ebully. Okay, <laughs> constantly. If by bully, you mean attempt to run a business with two. People, if you can call yourselves that, <laughs> who literally have the organizational abilities of not even like an ant. Or, no, ants are pretty good, like of a gnat. Something that's just <laughs> cannot organize itself into any kind of cohesive daily schedule or anything. That that's That's the only bullying I do. If there's a swear word in there sometimes because I get upset and aggravated. Nope. It, it just know it's out of love and it's for the wild times and the fans. Okay, whatever you need uh, to tell yourself. Forrest, you yes. you you have solicited a guest for today, and he's here. If you want to talk about that. Oh yes, wonderful. Well, you know, let's let him in. It's a bonus. We don't need to do a formal thing because it's a bonus. These are our friends. Let's let him in. Let's bring in. Okay. Let's bring in the mooch. All right. All right. There he is. Yo. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, this is the crew. Hey, here we are. <laughs> welcome, this welcome. is exciting. I want to introduce everybody to my buddy, the one and only Mooch, Steve Bramucci, <laughs> who is joining us today on the podcast to hang out, do the thing. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. I, I have to tell you guys, not only is this such a regular part of my, like, uh, podcast consuming world. The show is much funnier than I expected when I saw it announced or whatever. Like you guys do a great job with the humor. Oh, thanks, thanks, man. man. With Thank that, you. with that curse said, I'm sure this will be the least funny episode, <laughs> and all your fans will be very disappointed. That That's what Forrest was saying that. just before you came on, too. Yeah, it's it's weird that you guys are. Both Good well, joke, Peter. Page. Really good joke. That one really. <laughs> Wait, so I get mortified yeah. when I make bad <laughs> jokes. So. Steve, how do you how do you and Forrest know each other? He uh, gave us so very little information about you before. This. Yeah, that's no, true. Sure I was just like, he's here. Different. I was also running late today. What a day. Anyway, get into it. Let's go. He, yeah, I'm sure he just said this guy keeps pestering me on Instagram. I don't nope. really know who this dude is. Not but what I said. Let's, <laughs> let's give bit. him a shot. <laughs> um, no, so so I run the lifestyle section of an outlet called Uprocks, and oh, nice. for, we've featured Forrest a ton, and we like him, and every time, you, first of all, he has great <laughs> PR, so they're always hitting us yeah. every yeah. time. He, every time Forrest moves, yeah. his PR tells me about I don't mean like makes a move in the industry. Right. His PR is like, yo, Forrest woke up right now. Is that a <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, Ethan. Can you cover impressive. that? Yeah, yeah. Ethan. Um, that's what great. you get when you hire that's what you get when you hire twenty three year old PR guys who've never done it before and they're like, All right, I'm going. I'm I'm full that's steam ahead. It's yep. really good. <laughs> so we've covered a bunch of his stuff. And uh, I've just become such an admirer of him. And then I had a book project coming up. Yes. And as I kind of worked out the, you know, really what the book was about, I was like, you know, this is this is something that Forrest really needs to be kind of a voice for in some ways, or I at least to do my due diligence need to talk to him. So after one of our like 17 interviews that we've done with him <laughs> on Uprox, I'm sure it also sounded really random to him. I was like, hey, no, it's sick. I'm a children's book writer. Can I now steal an hour of your time to talk about, you know, Turtles. essentially like <laughs> saving and preserving endangered species? So uh, oh, cool. and he allowed me to. So now now we're I guess we're just linked. I'm just a person who's 
in your guys' orbit, and I get but to we, sneak around and, and hop on your podcast sometimes. Steve and I chat all the time. We've been talking about getting him out on an adventure so he could cover, you know, what it would be like to be in the field for Uprox and be a part of it. And that'd you be know, sick, yeah. So uh, has that book launched? Can we talk about that? It hasn't launched, but we can talk about it. I um, I got permission from my editors. The book, so I also, f- for those who don't know, uh, you know, I have kind of parallel careers. I do I do Uproxx, and then I also write children's books. And my first two books are really kind of body, wild, uh, comical adventures of a boy whose dad gets kidnapped by pirates. And my next one is a little more serious. I grew up, as I'm sure, like truly, Many of your nature-loving listeners did. I grew up with ADHD, didn't really have a place to put a lot of my energy. Mm. And it took a long time, took me pretty deep into adulthood to really figure out what was going on. Mm. And I spoke about it. I was on the REI podcast. Um, I do a fair bit of work for for Nat Geo and, and had a friend who did the REI podcast. And I was on that podcast and I spoke on, she came to a school presentation that I did. And I, in my school presentation, when I'm dealing with a lot of kids, I explain a little bit about how my attention works. And I, I tell this corny joke that I don't need to bother you guys with. But <laughs> I, I explain like how my brain works a little bit. And she really keyed in on that and made that really the focus of the entire podcast that she did with me. And then my editors heard the REI podcast and they were like, your next book needs to be about ADHD. Oh, and, shit. Okay. Uh, and so what it's about is a boy who, you know, in the children's book tradition, pretty common, you know, finds out that his great aunt who owns a cabin in the woods um, is also holding on to kind of an apocryphal uh, weird book of miscellany from his great great grandfather. And in there, there is a mention of a turtle with a shell like a carpus that is looks like rubies. Okay. And it gets fun. Stand by. It gets, it gets out, really fun. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I asked, you know, for so many turtle questions. But he goes <laughs> to the book believing, first of all, that this turtle is real and then looking for it. And, and moreover, it's kind of a, you know, everything I do is a little heisty. So it's kind of a, a kind of heist book in that the heist is against the other people who are looking for it. For that this was another turtle. Where Forrest mm. really helped because there's, you know, there are all these different forces that encroach on animals, obviously, one of them being poachers, and that's like the main villain of the book, but there's also like the possibility for people who are well-intentioned, but but maybe have the wrong idea. And then of course, habitat destruction and development can affect these things. So all these things kind of come into play and this boy is basically trying to save this turtle that that until the very end of the book, he doesn't know. I I love it, man. That's, uh, you know, I I have a kid right now. She's just like, 10 months old. So curious, okay. George is everything, but, uh, <laughs> but I love the books that I also enjoy, but it's a big thing in TV. Uh, it's the stupidest fucking phrase, but every goddamn pitch that you have, every meeting you have is about hiding the broccoli, right? Like right. Every, this idea it, of yeah. covering the broccoli and cheese. So nobody knows they're getting the takeaway. Right, that sounds sure. like a really cool wrapping paper for a story about conservation. You know, yeah. it's a fun heisty thing, but really you've, brought in poachers and habitat destruction and all that kids are going to like kind of get it without knowing that they were told about it exactly and and one thing i enjoyed steve if you don't mind me jumping in for a second is steve called me up and he's like so i got this idea right and it's it's not like you know steve's a turtle expert because you have to be a real nerd for that and he tells me basically everything that he just told us on the podcast here. And so we started drawing parallels. And Peter, maybe you can pull up a picture of this animal in a second. We started drawing parallels. because He's like, you know, how does it make sense? Sometimes this turtle's on land. Sometimes it's in the water, you know. And so we, we had to figure out, like, from an ecological standpoint, or rather from the ecology of the animal, what makes sense. So we started drawing parallels to the North American wood turtle. Now, the North American wood turtle... Uh, is this beautiful animal. It almost does look like it is made out of rubies because it has this incredible red coloration in its skin. And it spends a lot of, it's, it's quite secretive. It spends a lot of its time on land, but it also spends part of its time in the water. But it's a true turtle, it's not a tortoise. And it's also a huge victim of the pet trade and, and the illegal smuggling. And it's become a big problem with people trying to catch them and especially shipping them to Asia. There's a big fascination for North American turtle species in the pet trade in Asia. You pull up that picture, it's like five over there, Peter. Uh, let's see, it's that, that bright red one. 
Um, one over yeah. from where you are. And you can this see one? this animal looks like it's made of rubies already, which I think is fantastic. So it was really mm, fun for me. So, so outside of sort of anything that I ever do, when Steve came to me and said, can you help me figure this out? And, and we, we made it a real animal without making it a real animal, if you know what I mean. And I, I yeah, love yeah. that process, yeah. That's so, super fun. That was, a, that was one of those times where you kind of luck into someone, right? Because I was like, oh, and, and then it's going to be a turtle. And <laughs> that was kind of where I, I started and ended with Forrest. And then he was like, well, yeah, so give me an amalgam. Give me one that's kind of close. And the other one he gave me, which uh, if you're able to pull up a picture, I'm not trying to give you extra work, but was (laughs) the Vietnamese leaf turtle. That's right. Um, That's right. Sorry, I forgot we looked into that as well. Yep. And that one actually, you know, that one, what's interesting is this part of Oregon, which I'm so in love with. I just went mushroom foraging there, and and I know that your crew has been mushroom foraging lately. But this part of Oregon is so fascinating because it's the fourth, fourth rainiest place in the entire United States, you know, the lower 48. And it, um, yeah, there's the Vietnamese leaf turtle, which yeah. is kind of size-wise. But the other thing is that this area in Oregon gets so much rain and stays so temperate and never snows and, and is just kind of a buried valley that as I've done my research trips there, it feels, you know, I've traveled the Amazon a lot. I've traveled Vietnam a lot, Thailand. It feels much more like a tropical jungle than the kind of high desert forests of Eastern Oregon or whatever, you know, even the Mount Hood Range. So it's really cool because it's this green, lush area that feels like it would be someplace that we all recognize as tropical. Right. Nice. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. I have a question for you. Yep. So, I mean, the vast majority of anyone listening to this is people that are interested in wildlife. Sure. And I have read a t- My kid has a book called Nuffle Bunny. That was my <laughs> brother's kid's favorite book. Uh, 18 years ago. Yeah. This book's been around. For, yeah, it's a classic. <laughs> when I read it, a lot of children's books, I go, yeah, I could, I could have written this in an afternoon sometimes, yeah. right? I bet everyone listening right now has a children's book idea that they, sure. that they want to just write and get published. What is the, did you, was it because you were at Uproxx that you had a leg up? Like, what does it go from, I've got a weird idea about this kid who's Dad gets abducted by pirates, too. Yeah. You have a published book right. and a check in the fucking mailbox. I've written sure. three, I mean, by I'm the way, and I just wanted to say this for the Brosners that don't know this. I've written three, by the way, and I think I told you this, Steve. None of them have been able to go forward, and that's including attaching, like, my celebrity to it, right? And being like, right. hey, I'm on TV. I'll do a kid's well, book. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk yeah. about that. I got, I got <laughs> easy fixes. You've actually sent me the proposals, and I, yeah. I can get you set straight there. Um, and there you then go. you can sell those, and we can see those on the shelf. There you go. A, a story that kids want to hear. But um, so for me, actually, I was I was doing children's books before I did Up Rocks. I went I got my master's, a very expensive master's that put <laughs> me in crippling debt. Yeah. Uh, in, in writing for children. And, you know, like anything, you know, it's the, living in the ecosystem, being in the ecosystem, knowing people in that world is important. But I think, it, you know, there is that thing with children's books. I write novels for children and. You know, so they're longer. Like my books um, are 300, 400 pages. Oh, but, wow. But even then, you know, and I have a couple picture books that, that are I'm noodling on also. But even then, you know, every time I hang out with another dad, they're like, OK, so listen, bro, <laughs> I have this book idea. You write it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll you go it. I'll take half the money because I told you this idea that took me two minutes to come oh up God. with. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I right. think that we all know. Look, I, I, I mean, if all of life didn't happen in the execution, right? Then I would be Forrest. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because in, in the sense that that I have all the love of nature, he has. I have the adventurous spirit he has, but he's the dude who did you know put together expeditions, and I have found that for me. That has been a, a differentiator for why I'm, you know, I don't have a TV show called Extinct or Alive, you know. <laughs> and, and so I think, like, the same thing goes with children's books. If you're not the person, it, unless you have a significant degree of celebrity, if you're not the person who's going to put your butt in the chair and say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do the work to get this thing out there. And there is some gotcha. stuff with picture books, with structure, with, you know, picture books print. The way they print in China is so structured that the picture book itself has a very clear structure, which it has been, you know, but all that stuff's online and it's easy and it's a pretty welcoming community. And Interesting. It 
people and it supports people. So I encourage people to write children's books. I encourage them to be ambitious about it. There's a great children's book union, the SCBWI, that, that does great work. There are other great organizations that do great work. So definitely, if you have, if you have parents out there who have the next brilliant idea, either right. you know have them hit you up at a party for it or uh, or have them can, work on it yeah can i get a, just a super quick yes or no follow up before someone jumps in what did you write your first one on spec did you write the entire manuscript or was it a proposal that you mm-hmm. did that you got funding to write um i wrote my first book on spec nice so, so it's i i fucking I, ton I of work it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I believed in it. And then my my second book was part of the deal of the first book. It was a sequel. Mm. And then my third book I wrote on proposal, essentially. Let me ask you a question, Steve. How scary was that? Because Patrick and I have talked a few times about let's go out and make our own documentary. Right. But nobody ever makes money on those fucking things. Right. And at the end of the day. It's not like we're in this for the money, but if Patrick and I each sink half of our or quarter of our life savings into going out and making our own TV show, and then we make back four and a half thousand dollars, it's like, well, that's bankrupted and crippled us for for life. So, well, also the divorce will be expensive for each of us after that. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, on that note, like, how scary was it sitting there? And I, I guess your startup costs are not the same, but how scary was it sitting there putting in all that effort? and doing all that writing on spec. You, you know, you guys are wild because you're asking um, the, the exact questions that I have really good answers for <laughs> and maybe like cosmically should have been asked on this exact day. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I, I have two young kids now and I have a full-time job that is very demanding and I produce and show run for two shows for that full-time job. And I am writing a book that, uh, you know, my, my thing about that I tell people about creativity that used to be what I used to always say is if you can't, if you wouldn't sell it out of the trunk of your car, don't make it. And that was like 10 years ago before everyone we knew was making content. Sure. Right. Right. The weird right. thing now, go to a comedy club in L.A. and ask to do five minutes of improv and then walk up and, and use your five minutes to just say like, who here is not trying to monetize the making of content? Right, if right. You have one person, that's insane. Like, I don't know where you guys live in the country, but if I meet someone who doesn't make content, I'm like, holy shit, I gotta talk to you. And- <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> shit, laugh, dude. Just wants to consume stuff. Right, and right. Not like monetize it. So, so you know, true. I, I, Seriously. I think that having a deep belief in what you do is really, really magical. You guys wanna hear a crazy cool story. It's one of my favorite stories ever. This is about creativity, but it's still a dope story. (laughs) I'm going to tell you guys a story about Komodo dragons later, but this story about I was going to say, we haven't even got into Komodo dragons yet, but that's okay. all right. But but this story about creativity, I'm glad to have it on some hard drive somewhere because it is the best thing I've ever heard. So, um, (laughs) you know, I I have a younger cousin. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I got this younger cousin... And he noticed me following a rapper on Instagram. A young woman, she's 22 years old, uh, she's white, she comes from a relatively privileged background, um, and she is killing it, like absolutely killing the game and is, is so successful. And I followed her on Instagram and he was like, hey, I followed her too. I noticed that we follow each other. You know, she and I went to high school together. Huh. And I was like, oh, cool. And then here, me trying to be a little bit of the flossing uncle, Uprox, for those that don't know, is owned by Warner Music, the second largest re- record label on earth. So I was like, okay, well, check this out. Next time she comes to town, I'll get us backstage passes. And of course, this woman is very talented, but she's playing like small rooms. There's no real backstage. And yeah. I, I was just kind of speaking out of turn. <laughs> but then I like corrected myself. And I was like, actually, you could get us backstage because you know her. Right. Right. <laughs> and he goes, oh, it, it's not really like that with her. And I was like, oh, tell me why. And he goes, well, we used to tease her a lot when we were in high school. And I was like, oh, snap, why did you guys tease her? And he goes, because she was always trying to rap. No kidding. I was like, yeah. I was like holy shit. <laughs> this woman knew. 
You guys were mocking her. He was like, yeah, she would rap the, the school announcements, and she would rap like uh, at the talent show. And I was like, you guys were mocking her and teasing her, and she looked at you, and she heard it all, and she fucking knew that she was going to break through. Right. And now she's hanging out with Dame Lillard, the most popular bra- blazer. She has, you know, this guy's a superstar right. basketball player who also raps. She's got records with him, the whole deal. Yeah. She knew, and they they didn't know. And I think like any time you can have that level of certainty to your creative projects, then you feel like you have a purpose. Sure, uh, yeah. that I is fucking sure. cool. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, I think that's the craziest thing. You know, I've run a show. Uh, I I'm the co-show runner for this show, People's Party with Talib Kweli. It's a it's a that's a mouthful. Interview show, that's a, a tongue like twister. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's centered on the hip hop world. And I have met so many rappers over the past couple of years, all these heroes of mine. Mm-hmm. And the number one thing that I have seen over and over is that they're creatively fearless. Yeah. And I right. think that that's, you know, that's the ultimate lesson is like, do we have an idea that is so good? And do we know there's an audience appetite for it? Do we know that there's an audience who would be intrigued by it? And if so, then we just have to dive. Yeah. What, I, it, what it, I'm it, hearing yeah. here is that Pat, uh, I should have kept going with my hip hop career after I, I sent know. you that one track, and you. I think you just laughed, and and that was it. <laughs> that I, was the I encouraged it. Yeah. it. I encouraged it because I wanted more. Peter, while he was blacked out, made a beat and recorded a, an entire full length rap song called "The Little Things" and sent it to me, and I liked <laughs> I it. I listened to it more than once. <laughs> you did, Forrest. Wow. <laughs> Forrest, what were you gonna say? Uh, oh, sorry. That was way, way funnier than anything I was going to say. But I was just going to say, isn't it interesting to think back to that woman in high school and how many people like I wonder if her parents were really supportive of the rap thing right. or not. And it doesn't really matter. But how many people go through that? And I used to get sort of made fun of because I was the animal nerd as well. Right. I'd show up to school and I'd have a snake in my pocket and I'd be like, ha, ah, this is cool. Or like. You know, a bug, a bug would be well, crawling on cool. the window, and everybody would be like, oh, gross, a bug. And I'd, like, run over and save it with a little paper cup, you know, and, like, take it outside. And everybody like, Forrest, fuck a dork. And, like, all the cool all the cool kids were like, I should have killed that spider. And it's like, yeah, well, I didn't. Um, but my point is, I was very supported by my, my mom in particular, and I didn't really care. Like, the teasing didn't bug me. So I just kept going with the thing I was passionate about, which was wildlife, never knowing what it would lead to. She might have been the same, but how many people had that squashed out of them by society, right? Whether it's teasing in high school. 92%. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's the exact number. So no, but you know what I mean? It's like whether it was squashed out of you by teasing in high school or your parents saying, you know, get a real job or college or whatever it is. Or having, yeah, having financially pragmatic parents, right? Totally. uh, Right. You know? I'm I'm 42 and I am making a lot of the moves that that I would probably have a lot less anxiety about if I was maybe 35. Right. Sure. And right. Right. When right. I try to attribute those seven years to something, what I attribute those words, those seven years to, is the fact that I always held a second job and and like a pretty serious second job, because I never did the thing which I encourage everyone to do now, which is like. Go live in the ecosystem of it. If you want to be a Hollywood writer, go live in the ecosystem of it. If you want to be the next forest, go live in an ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Literally right. an ecosystem, yeah. And cut, you know, and right. come back. And that's really all there is to it. Cause I think like trying to do it the way I did it, which is like, oh, I have a foot in this world, but just in case I'm, you know, I was teaching grade school between travel writing trips. You know, just in case yeah. I'm doing this other little thing, it, it's going to slow it down. And then well, the, you start to have, like, kids and all that stuff, and then it really starts to crash together. Yeah, no mm-hmm. shit. There's, you there's have such a battery a, in your back to make it work then. There's such yeah. a, in today's society, too, like, imagine when we were kids, you didn't even have the internet. And, and all of that type of, like, pressure and judgment coming from you. It's like, at, in one respect... You're able to create this content. You're able to connect with so many people because of social media and all these ways to do it. But at the same time, the the scrutiny is like magnified times a million percent. So like, imagine right. that. Right. Like if, if you, growing up in that, I it would be hard to even imagine. Like I got made fun of by my brother, and sure it gave me a thick skin, but it would be tough in in well, being a kid growing up. It's like just this. funny because if in my high school in Oswego, New York. 
if there was a girl who was trying to be a female rapper, she would have absolutely been made fun of for it. Yeah. No question, right? For sure. And it just makes you think, like, none of the things that make you cool by the time you're 20 are really things that make you cool in high school. Like, right. the totally. virtues in high school that make you cool are may maybe being kind of dumb or playing sports. Right. So cool if you're going to be a professional athlete. Great, you should do that. Just point uh, zero, zero, and being zero, tough. one percent. Yeah, being and tough. Being totally. tough and not giving a fuck. And, and, all, and actually calling the kids who are achieving well in school with grades nerds and dorks. Totally. Right? That's, that's, how, you that's cool. your path to coolness. Tur correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's a system that's designed to crush anything outside of the box, essentially. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, they, true. They, as you say, it, it, you know, it doesn't hold up much longer than two years after you graduate. Right. Totally. Exactly. Six months. Totally. Like, yeah. They did such a world. good. They did such a good job of uh, explaining and showing that in the Twenty One and Twenty Two Jump Street movies, where uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Obviously, mm -hmm. you have, Steve. But like, it's so funny because like Channing Tatum goes back to high school, right? And he's like being oh, yeah. the same high school kid he was. 15 years prior or whatever, and he, like, shows up in his Letterman jacket, and he's like, you study, fucking nerd. And, like, yeah. he's, like, super <laughs> yeah. cool. And then, uh, you know, it's, like, times have changed. It's, like, a super progressive school, and they're all about, like, saving the environment and, like, don't use plastic <laughs> and don't don't drive gas guzzlers, you know, whatever. And he ends up, like, being the loser for being, like, a, a jock <laughs> athlete. It's just, I mean, I'm explaining a movie that everybody's listening has seen, but it's just, like, I thought it was so clever the way they did that because I'm like, I don't know what high school's like now. I don't know if that's how it is or if it's like if it's like when we were there. I have no idea. I, I have no clue either, man. Yeah. I don't know what these kids are <laughs> dealing so with. We're so out of touch. Yep. We're so out of yeah, touch we're the right old now. guys. Yeah, it's everyone here is in their 40s almost. But yeah. you're not cool. You're not. Yeah. You're not at that stage where your kids in high school, so you get like a second wind of it, and you kind of figure yeah. out what's going on. So we're just like in limbo land where we're like. I don't know what's cool. Like, I'm wearing a polo today. Is that okay? I don't fucking know. Like, you know. Like, <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely okay. not cool. Especially with the collar yeah. all jacked up like this. <laughs> way, I mean, it's not cool. Listen, I would yeah. like to disengage myself from all this not cool talk. I'm cool as shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, a lifestyle outlet for young people. That's I true. Taste. That's true. He's that's still true. Yeah. I see four cartons of Metamucil behind you in your. Uh, <laughs> you can hang out with Talib Kweli all day long. I do take a lot of supplements. I get the supplements hard. I'm cool. You have Metamucil behind you. <laughs> I'm the coolest. I'm the coolest. You are cool, yeah. Steve. No, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I think we nailed it. Really, people should be listening to this podcast today for, for deep human truths. And now this Komodo really? dragon story I'm about to tell. Yeah, yeah. do you have time, Steve? Dragon, please. What's that? Do you have time? I know you had a hard out coming up. Time. I'm, I got to tell you guys this story because you'll like it. Please. Cool. Get into Let's it. Let's have it. So, you know, I, I said that, like, my childhood dream would probably be in many ways to be forest. And I think, like, I've, I, I've been a travel writer for 20 years. And I've gone on some pretty grand adventures, you know, um, gone deep into the into the. Australian bush with Aboriginal elders and driven myself on safari for four months through East Africa and, and oh, ridden wow. a traditional Vietnamese zampan down the Mekong Delta Sick. multiple times. Did that. Sick. So so I've been on some big adventures and I've always tried to figure out like why um, you know why why have I not like had the sort of adventure that you write a book about and I think a big part of it is, is that I'm you know, because of ADHD, perhaps, like I'm not really a true planner. And I think that that's, you know, Forrest, when I met him and when I read his book, that was a thing that I really saw. So this story is a little bit of, of that in the sense that I had always wanted to go to see Komodo dragons. And that had been my fantasy since I was a kid. You remember those Nat Geo books. And one oh, yeah. of the things that fascinated me about Komodo dragons, you know, back then was just the idea of it. It feels very Jurassic. It feels very dangerous. What fascinates Accurate. me more as an adult <laughs> now is the fact that we're really still, like, figuring out these animals and how they work. Right. There's people right now arguing whether or not it's okay to characterize uh, their saliva as a venom. Right, we still don't know. We still don't know. We still don't know if we're they're poisonous or venomous. That. We don't know. This is the biggest lizard in the world, and we're right. like, 
Is it is it venomous? Uh, I don't know. It might be poisonous. Well, I don't fucking know. <laughs> uh, like, what do you think? Exactly. And it's yeah. the biggest lizard wow. in the world. It's not like some fucking tiny bug in the middle of Papua New Guinea where you're like, I don't know what's going on with that thing. It's like they're in <laughs> they're in the fucking San Diego Zoo. They're in the Bronx Zoo. They're everywhere. We don't know anything about their spit. It's crazy. Sorry. It's crazy. It's crazy. And and you know it's so bizarre in the sense that you know. <laughs> First of all, even that revelation came out in 2009. Right. That they finally, they were looking for venom glands up here, and they weren't finding any. They finally went deeper in the neck, and they found a venom-producing gland. But now that's being debated Which is still, as yeah. to whether... Sorry, go ahead. What you got effect it. that saliva yep. has on killing prey, right. or if it's just the trauma and blood loss. Now, before that, when I was a kid, they thought that it was bacteria in the mouth of the lizard yep. that mm. killed yep. things. That's that was the whole story with Sharon Stone's husband getting bit that I mm -hmm. read right. when it happened was that it was bacteria. Right. Right. That yep. was the common. And that's still, by the way, today, like the common thing. You know, it's like your teacher telling you that there's water in a camel's hump. Right. It's like you're still <laughs> getting taught that shit in school, which is wrong. But anyway, keep <laughs> right. Still getting passed along. Yeah. Anyone who writes books of any capacity knows that. That the idea, the archaic idea that everything in books is pitch perfect or, or you know, perfectly fact-checked is wild. So, yeah. Um, so I had always wanted to go out to see these dragons. I'm in Bali, and I'm doing the Bali thing, which, in, you know, at this time was a little bit less um, touristy than now, but still kind of, you know, pretty touristy, pretty Australian-heavy, surf-heavy. And I was like, <laughs> a lot okay. Of, a lot this, of drugs and partying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, And I was like, okay, this is my chance to go see these dragons. And so I got a motorbike on uh, Lombok and I rode a motorbike across Lombok. And I <laughs> I was with, at the time, my girlfriend, I have to say her name, because I, I go on a lot of podcasts and every time I've told a story about traveling with her, I get like a call later like, hey, I was <laughs> purged from that story. <laughs> <laughs> But I was with my girlfriend at the time. Her name was Katrine. It still is Katrine. Um, <laughs> and we were, we were traveling. So we traveled across Rinka and then uh, two other islands. And then we took an overnight ferry. And on the overnight ferry, I actually accidentally converted to Islam. Okay. Um, okay. Nice. Okay. That happens often, you know, I've Indonesia, heard. Indonesia, for those who don't know, is the most populous uh, Muslim country in the world and is yep. almost completely Muslim. We just often think of Bali where there's a, a Hindu community. Right. And okay. so um, they were on the way to a convention of Hafez. Hafez are people who can recite the Quran forward and back. The rule is that, that you give them one sentence from the Quran and they have to be able to do the rest of it. Okay. So anywhere they pop in. So it's a con convention of these very devout men, and um, they kind of like using the language gap got me to convert somehow, and <laughs> held me held up my hand at the end, and all the other men clapped. So I had that going for me. I finally get to the <laughs> island of Flores, and Ooh. then the island, and then the island of Rinca. So yeah. if, if you know, you know, Komodos are found on four islands, um, the main three being Flores, Komodo Island, and Rinca. And Rinka is really the most wild environment for these dragons. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's no aspect of it that is theme parky. This is like dragons out living in the wild. At the time when I went, you could you could essentially become an amateur forest by just <laughs> going to the research station and yeah. and visiting. And that's mm. what I did. I, I just rocked up to the research station and they give you a stick. And yeah. you your your bashing stick, you, your defense stick, yeah, that's exactly. the same as when I was there, yeah, like, <laughs> like Huck Finn's stick, you know, that he has like a satchel on, and every time you see a dragon, it comes towards you, and you just kind of push it away, <laughs> and then it comes this way, mm -hmm. and you just kind of push it away, <laughs> and it's like a video game. They're everywhere, and, and, and they, they don't. And what, what was crazy, Steve? What, what year were you there? Do you remember? So this was like 2008. Okay, I think I was there in 2009, so our experiences are very, very paralleled. But um, yeah. the one thing I, I just want to interrupt, just because it's interesting, no, it's they just hand you this stick, and then they're like, enjoy, and you just walk <laughs> out into this, like, variable Jurassic Park, this, like, land of living dinosaurs. <laughs> and by the way, a lot of people don't know this, juvenile to subadult Komodo dragons live in trees. So you're walking through this island and there's Komodo dragons like 15 feet overhead looking at you fucking salivating. There's huge ones on the ground right beside you hiding in the bushes and you've got this like two foot long poking stick and you're like, <laughs> and this is coming from me who's like not very scared of anything but I'm like, 
oh fuck, like there's dragons everywhere, and you're just like poking oh, and, them out of the way. Shit. Yeah, it's crazy. And they are they are really keen to kill you. Oh yeah, they're uh, coming at like, you. Yeah, and you're pushing them with the stick. Yeah, Jesus. same exact thing. But sorry, please so keep going. I just wanted to paint that picture. Mostly because this you're included. You know, when we talk about like venomous snakes, they don't particularly want to kill you. You're part of their defense mechanism. Right. Killing you would be part of a defense mechanism. Well, you're part of a, Komo talking about Komodo dragons who are also cannibalistic, who eat carry out, eat like, you know. They're licking they their lips actually would the love whole time. To kill you. Yep, the whole yeah, time. You're a great option for them. <laughs> and so, you know, I've spent a lot of time on safari. I've, I learned how to track cheetahs on foot, all these things. I've never felt a fear like this. Amazing. This was like a constant, <laughs> looming, ominous fear. I mean, one of the wildest things is I was so keen and ramped up to spend time with them. My girlfriend, we had been traveling for eight months, and she sat on the porch of our little hut, which is elevated, and she cleaned out some underwear, and she had had her period. And just stirring up right. that amount of blood oh, made boy. the dragons come to her. That is what? nuts. What? Tried to attack her in the cabin. Yeah. Oh my Holy god. That amount Shit. of blood. Shit. They tell yeah, you, and not just insane. on a smell level, by the way. When I got there, I was wearing like a musty reddish t shirt. Like, not even like a bright red t shirt. And they're like, take off your shirt. So I ended up walking around Komodo Dragon shirtless because, or Komodo Island and, and, and Bintang Flores shirtless because. The red shirt that I had on, they're like, you can't wear that. Like, you're basically like, you look yeah, like blood. Yeah, right. There was pictures being taken. That's the only reason your shirt was uh, popped up. True, man. but yeah. um, I <laughs> wish the I had more The guys who work there, yeah. I mean, they tell truly the best stories that I've ever heard because they would tell you these stories that would just kind of ramp up your fear factor. I remember one of them, they were like, oh, there's a teacher, a local teacher. And he... Um, you know, he was looking for some honey up in the trees. And while he was looking for honey, then a dragon bit his leg. <laughs> uh -oh. And the story's kind of getting told through a language barrier, and you're like, okay, wild. Then what happened? Right. <laughs> and, and the guys kind of look at each other and shrug and go, <laughs> he found a very nice cane. <laughs> and that's the end of the story, you know? Or there was another guy, they were like, oh, you know, one of our guides got bit, but it was no big deal. It was just by a tiny dragon. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? They were like, well, it was a baby. It was this big. He fell asleep smoking a cigarette in the guide hut, and, and he got bit. And I was Yikes. like, okay, what happened? And they're like, well, he's still in hospital. We'll see how it goes. Right, And I was like, right. oh, when did he got, get bit? And they go, 14 months ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, holy shit, dude. I, I, By a I baby. should explain. I might have some pictures that I can send you, Peter, and, and we can share it along with this. And I'm sure you do, Steve, so you should send us over watch. some. But these huts that Steve's talking about, like where the ranger station is and stuff, they these animals are habituated to people as well, especially around the huts. Once you get out, it's a different feeling. But... You are literally like walk, like weaving through these like 12 foot long dinosaurs and the biggest density and concentration of them is around all the living in human quarters. Like there's like a dozen of them. And it's like, if you just like had three beers and you're like, I'm gonna go over to Steve's hut and hang out and have a beer with him. And it's like sunset, you would walk out and trip over a fucking dragon Nice. Trying to get to Steve's hut, which is like where my car is parked, which I can see from here. You know what I mean? It's just like wow. they're fuck. It's like a landmine. It's crazy, but so cool. It's crazy. It, yeah, it's the wildest thing. I mean, the one of the funniest things that I've ever seen, and I've traveled to you know sixty some countries and been a travel writer for twenty years. Seen a seen a few things in this world, but the, there's a game that men play in Indonesia. It's essentially like volleyball, but it's with the feet. And these guys were playing it on really rough, the guides were playing it on very rough, uneven ground. And there was no joke, six dragons watching. <laughs> and, and they're watching them play the game and the guys have their sticks kind of near, but it was like watching spectators be like, listen guys, if one of these dudes cuts their toe, then we go, right? Yeah, like, yeah, right. <laughs> you just felt right. that energy. It was the highest stakes I've ever seen for a game. Wow. <laughs> and so, Oh, yeah, yeah I, I didn't want to interrupt your story. I wasn't sure if it was if you're no, still going. So, so from there, you know, I, I went out with the guides and learned how to track the dragons, learned how to observe them, finally observed a hunt, which I when I tell school kids about it, I always tell is like um, is a little bit like an awkward high schooler flirting. You know, there's like a uh, there's a buffalo water buffalo and it's standing there. 
and then the dragon kind of walks up and it goes kind of slow and it's like, hey, what's up? Like super hot today, huh? And the <laughs> buffalo's like, yeah, it's pretty hot. And then the dragon just bit on to the shoulder of the buffalo and the buffalo goes, like, like wow. the sound that you make when you like pull your car out and you see like a line of traffic in front of you. You're like, ah. <laughs> and the buffalo made that sound. And then it, you know, that smell attracted literally like 60 other dragons, large and small. And they tore it to absolute pieces and just like ravished. I'll send you guys some photos that you. So can you use saw this predation event. What's that? You got to see this, this predation event. Oh yeah. And oh it was, wow, that's I. Was that's amazing. Insane. And and you know, animals are coming for you during it, and so you're keeping <laughs> animals that can't get into the main mix with the buffalo. You're keeping them away from your own ankles. Right. And then when they gorge themselves, because they only eat, you know, they can eat as few as twelve meals a year. They mm. gorge themselves so heavily, then they go and lay in the sun. And Sounds there's a great. few things I've done in my life where being impulsive has really seemed so dumb in retrospect. But one of them was with poison dart frogs in the Amazon. And another one of them was going up to one of these dragons to look at it and having the guide who was working there and in science say, lift up its tail so you can get a <laughs> sense of it. And I was like... Oh, I just saw it eat a buffalo, like the face <laughs> off a buffalo. Are you sure I should do that? Like, yeah, you're good. So I did it. I don't know why I did it. That's but I awesome. Lifted it up. I got a sense of it, and uh, and luckily didn't have my face bitten off. That's awesome. <laughs> well, that's so really cool. Go to, ahead. To bring the story home, side cut to all of this is that I was having a terrible time sleeping because the guides, and I, that is probably, I've probably had 20 bad nights of sleep in my life. It's very easy thing for me to get. And six of them were at this guide canteen. <laughs> and the guides were telling me these horrible stories. Every night there was a different story about someone who had been killed by the, the dragons. Mm -hmm. Damn. And then I would go into my hut and they had open windows. Right. And everything was fine. And then mosquitoes would start to swarm. And then when the mosquitoes started to swarm, then bats would fly in. And you would have so many bats circling your head. And every once in a while, you know, when we learn about bats in school, we go like, echolocation, that's dope. They're flying through the trees. But echolocation, like any human sense or animal sense, is not perfect. <laughs> so sometimes these bats would hit each other mm -hmm. and they'd go, ah! and then they'd go, ah! and you'd hear them falling towards your head. And then sometimes they'd Fucking like hell. for a split Jesus. second and take off, or their wings would catch and they'd take off. This is so my nightmare. I was nightmare. sleeping horribly. <laughs> I had I had seven days with the dragons. I was sleeping terribly the whole time. Finally, on the seventh day, the day we're supposed to take off, I walk out on this dock, and I put my stick down. I dive in the dock a few times, and I read a book. I'm like, I'm just gonna read my book, and. This is how they get you, because one of the stories they told me was about a Dutch photographer who fell asleep next to a tree, and I was like, what happened mm -hmm. with him? I know that story, they yep. Were like, I w they were like, well, guess what? I was like, what? They found the photos. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. Not the guy. Yikes. Right. They uh, found his so, camera. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, they found his camera. Whew. So I laid down on the dock, and I was like, okay, I'm going to read a book. And I've been using this trick ever since I was a kid. I was like, watch this. I'm going to read one page, and then I was like, oh, what would be really effective, I'll read this page like this, and then I'll flip, and I'll read this page like this. I'll kind of have my head down on the dock. <laughs> and, of course, before I get through, through three lines, it's sunny out, and I fall asleep. Uh-oh. And, <laughs> and this is why I'm not, like, Forrest. Like, I'm not quite as analytical and dialed in. <laughs> Luckily, you know, I've made so many mistakes in my life and not listened to that little ping that you get, like, at the, at the base of your neck so many times. But I just felt that ping, and my spidey senses went up, and I popped to my feet, and there was a dragon coming towards me past my stick, and it was walking towards me, and its jaws were just dripping that drool that oh they have. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And it looks they're, like... They're, I should just mention that for, for everybody listening. They're frothing, like, the whole time looking at you. Really? Like, the way your dog is, like, right when you put the food in his bowl before you put the food <laughs> down. That's what Komodo right. dragons are doing while they're watching you. It's crazy. Like, you see the saliva and froth around their mouths the whole time. 
which adds to the whole feeling, by the way. But I just wanted to explain that so people know. It's like crazy. No, that's absolutely it. Uh, it's frothing. It's coming towards me. I'm terrified. Jump in the water. Of course. <laughs> Leave the book for the dragon. Dragons can supposedly swim. Get over to a boat. <laughs> they have a stick on the boat. I'm able to eventually hop back on the dock. Um, <laughs> How close was oh he God. to you, that dragon? I was reading. I was. I always say I was reading, uh, which is true. I mean, I was reading um, the collected Sherlock Holmes. And I always tell kids that if they find a dragon who seems to know a lot about mysteries, <laughs> that was the one. Um, he, by, by the time I jumped off the dock, he was within three feet. Like, I, it was oh, the wow. end of the video game. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah, it was, it was terrifying. So Wild. I got incredibly lucky, and uh, yeah. That's, well, we're that's, happy you're here go. today. That's, with There's us. the Komodo dragon story I was itching to tell Forrest. That's awesome, dude. That's, that is fu- that's, that's a wild story, dude. That's <laughs> really cool. Your story, everything about your Komodo dragon experience is 10x better than mine, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's <laughs> not just because I'm jealous you got to see a predation event, you had a near run-in, you got to lift one's tail up. I, and you might have read this in my book, Steve, poisoned myself with fire carl two days before i went to komodo (laughs) and um was sick as shit and spent the whole day throwing up on something that had been a lifelong dream of mine to see and do which was see these dragons and i felt like death warmed up all day long and it i think the dragons knew because i had similar experience with holding the stick and them sort of chasing me around all day long but it was miserable. I had one of the worst days ever for something that had been on my bucket list since I was two years old. Meanwhile, you like had your girlfriend there. You had them by your feet. They tried to eat you. You saw a predation event. A fucking amazing story. I'm very well, jealous. Well, was a long time. I decamped with them. We were there for a full week, so we had a lot of time to play. And, oh, that's and, cool. You know, kind of spend time there, but... It was, it was certainly an event that, you know, I think one of the craziest things that all, all four of us, you know, from having listened to the show, would share with people, would share with adults, would share with kids, is like, one of the craziest things about life is that the things that you dream of as a kid, they could be very hard, but especially when it comes to experiences, mm-hmm. sometimes they're not. Like, sometimes buy a plane mm-hmm. ticket and take three motorbikes and four ferries across Indonesia, and you're there, and then you did the thing. Right. Uh, I, I, I think say that that's a really cool thing about I, life. I, I say this all the time to people, which is people are like, you're so lucky you got to do this and you got to do this. When I made, I made those decisions to do those things, right? While other people had a car, I didn't have a car because I saved that money to go to Komodo and go to Australia and see the things that were important to me. While other people had, a, had you know, all these material items and this job and that, I made the choice and decision to go and see these things because that was more important to me than having a car, right? Or than, yeah. than doing some of these things. And so I think one thing I always tell people is everybody thinks, oh, you're so lucky. Like this, these are such unobtainable things. Of course, some of them are right now that I've, I'm, 10 years, 20 years down. Yeah, now that you have two Rolls Royces, yeah. Right, right, right. But those are, you know, those are only my sidecars. But some of those things are unobtainable. But it, not, nothing that you... automobiles. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Nothing you want to do in the wildlife space. No adventure, no travel is unobtainable to anybody that lives in the United States. If you can afford to get your Starbucks, if you can afford to own a car... Uh, you can afford to do these things that we're talking about. It just has to be a priority for you. And I, I don't know. I get so annoyed when people go with, oh, must be nice, so lucky. And I'm like, no, I made these choices to get into these scenarios. Like, you can too. Anybody can do it. I consider right. it luck that you're just even alive. That's that's what I can. Cons- why that's I a whole another lucky. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, did either of you guys make it to Flores Island when you were there? That's I've always yeah. thought that was a really I fascinating did make it to place. Flores, yeah. Yeah. We Is stayed on Bintang of, Flores. Did you get into the bush? Like, did you get into the jungle much? Uh, I did. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever told this story on the podcast or if I, I can't remember if I wrote about it on my book or not. But on our last day there, that was where I got jabbed in the butt from the fire Carl burn and this oh, little okay. like, hut and everything. The one story that I didn't tell, though, uh, I don't remember if I wrote about this in my book or not, but um, one of my other lifelong reptilian dreams was to catch a big reticulated python. And they only occur in that part of the world. And I've caught anacondas. I've caught African rock pythons. I've, seen a bu- I've caught a bunch of the Australian species, but I've never caught a big reticulated python. So I was telling this local guy about this reticulated python dream of mine because I was in the area and I'd constantly be be looking. 
Now, we had a flight out of Bintang Flores at like 3 p.m., and on the last night, the guy says to me, he's like, well, there's like Fluffy, the, the reticulated python that lives outside the village in the cave that everybody knows about. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, it's huge. It's, it's 25 feet long, which it wasn't, you know, I assume. <laughs> but um, it, uh, <laughs> I'm like, big. well, we have to go there. And he's like, well, your flight's at 3, you know, you have to be there two hours before, and you have to get to, you have to, it takes an hour to get to the airport, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't care. I have to go. So we wake up pre-dawn because we're out of time. He drives me to the middle of nowhere. We hike in the bush uh, for about an hour and a half, and we get to the mouth of this gigantic cave. Have I told this story before on the pod? I don't remember. No? No, no. You're too deep uh, in to stop now. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. I'm loving yeah. yeah. that. just stop. So I get, I get to the, yeah, the end. I get to the mouth of this gigantic cave, okay? And, it, it, and I say to the guide who was with us, I can't remember his name anymore, I'm like, let's go inside. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, I'm not going in there. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm not going in there. He's like, there's a giant fucking snake in there. I'm not going in there. And I'm like, oh, okay, sweet. So it's me, my girlfriend, <laughs> and this guy. And so I turn to my girlfriend, Jess, and I'm like, you coming with me? And she's like, if I have to. So we start walking into this cave, <laughs> yes. and it goes from, you know, like the size of, like, I don't know, a garage, like a two-car garage, gets narrow very quickly. And as you go in and it narrows, we start off, and your boots are like, you know, an inch deep in guano because there's bats everywhere, which, by the way, reticulated pythons eat. So I'm like, that makes sense. And as you keep stepping in, the guano keeps rising up. And all of a sudden, our, our shoes are flooded with bat shit. And then it's up to our knees. And it gets to about Ugh. Jessica's knees, and she's like, I'm out. She's like, I, I, I don't even like <laughs> yeah, this big enough. snake thing. The, the, the guy wow. who lives here says we shouldn't be in here. I'm out. She's like, I'm covered in fucking bat Smart shit, and I have girl. to be at the airport in an hour and a half. I'm out. So I'm like, great, I'll keep going. <laughs> So I continue further into this cave looking for a snake that is allegedly like 20, 25 feet long that everybody's terrified of, and I get nipples deep in guano. I am literally nipples deep in pure bat shit in this cave in the middle of Bintang Flores, nowhere near anybody. I can't even see light from the entrance of the cave any longer. I can't see my girlfriend. The, the guide never even came near the mouth, so he's, he's long gone. So if this snake decides to get me, I'm done, though, right? I'm nipples deep in guano Sounds in like a cave in the Lord middle of, of the nowhere. Rings. Movie it was disgusting. Going on it smelt horrific. Anyway, I'm cruising around. I got my, my flashlight or my headlamp, whatever it was, and I see the shimmer. Like up on a ledge where the bats are, I see the shimmer. I'm like, oh fuck, there's the snake. There's the snake. And I wait, and the, it doesn't move and it doesn't coil. And now snakes often will just lie very dormant, right? But it just didn't do anything. I'm like, something's wrong. So I s climb up this wall. And you can just imagine, I'm already nipples deep in bat shit. The cave walls are caked in bat shit. It's just bat shit everywhere, right? <laughs> so now I'm climbing up this wall to, to get to an allegedly 25-foot snake. Reticulated pythons, also the only known snake in the world that actually actively prey on people, by the way. They are they are a terrifying animal and um, very strong. Couldn't have overpowered it, so I don't know what I was thinking. And I pull myself <laughs> up, and it's not the snake. But it is a snake skin. To this day, I wish I had taken, but it was so beautiful the way it was sitting there. And this snake skin looked like a sleeping bag. I mean, I could have easily gotten my entire body in and out of it. And it stretched for, and now keep in mind, skins stretch when the snakes pull them off, so it makes them even bigger than you, you know, but in your head, it gets even bigger and bigger. It was at least a 20, 22 foot long snake skin that I could have climbed inside of. And it's up on oh, this ledge, shit. looking over where I was just completely stuck in bat shit. Like, there's no running if I chose to run. Like, I'm wading through muck. And uh, I looked, and I looked at this, and I looked back towards the cave entrance. I couldn't even see light, couldn't see my girlfriend, couldn't see the guide. And it was one of the few times in my life where logic prevailed, and I was like, Nope, even if he's here, there's no reason for me to be here. Like, I can't catch him. Yeah. I don't have a camera. Like, there's nothing to do in this scenario but lose. And so I climbed back down. I left the sleeping bag-sized snakeskin, and I exited filthy and fucking disgusting and covered in sweat and bat shit to an annoyed wife or girlfriend and a very confused guide, and we quickly ran back. I jumped in the ocean and got on the plane. But, uh, yeah, that was... that was anyway, That's a I'll, great story. <laughs> that was I the only... That. That was the only... <laughs> Thanks, Peter. That <laughs> was my only... Guy, who is this guy who lets me come on to tell my Komodo dragon story and I ramble on for 20 minutes and then he kills it? No, it your story's way story cooler. Your story's way, way cooler <laughs> than my stupid... Yeah, my stupid He's always fucking... got to be a one-upper, man. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. That, that was not my point. I am excited because we're talking about <laughs> a fun place. Joking. 
But I pirated Patrick's thing, which was talking about the bush of Bintang uh, or Bintang Flores, and that's the only experience I had in Bintang Flores because I we focused our efforts on the on the dragons. So, anyway, sorry, Patrick. No, go we ahead. must we must really be kindred spirits because the climax of my first novel for kids takes place on a pile of bat guano in a cave in Indonesia. <laughs> oh, oh, I wow. didn't know that. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Yeah. So what are the odds uh, of that? Yeah, this is a great time for anyone to throw up the cover on the B-roll of uh, the Danger <laughs> Gang and the Pirates of Borneo. Yes, agreed. Peter, can you do that? Peter's frozen. So, no, no, I'm not. No pressure. Oh no, he's frozen. Uh, he's frozen in fear now that he has to quickly find them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Remember the name you just said. And well, there, yeah. so proceeds. Some of the proceeds from my first novel went to protect orangutans in um, in. Borneo, which is nice. which occurred, they appeared in the book heavily, um, and then some of the proceeds of my second book also went to animal preservation and conservation, and then Forrest, to his credit, has also connected me with a nonprofit for some of the proceeds to this third novel about turtles. Very cool. cool. Danger Gang and the Pirates of Borneo, great title, great yeah. title. Look at yeah. that. Um, well, dude, this has been uh, really fun, man. I, I, it's you got a lot of great stories. I'd love to have you back on yes. to talk about your four months uh, driving through East Africa. I think oh. that's that'd make a good hour. I have yeah. so many uh, insider tips for anyone who wants to do it on their own. I, I it's a thing that I love very much. So I, I as I say. I am a legitimate fan of this podcast, uh, and I'm a fan of what you guys are doing and trying to build, and I just really love it. And Thanks, dude. And obviously, you know, Thanks, Forrest, man. we love so, so much over <laughs> at Uprocks. Um, it, you know, just to shout out Uprocks Life and everything we do, and, and we're trying to build there, and, and hopefully, you know, bring some of these conversations that you're having to our very mainstream young audience, and then also... You know, if you have, if any of your listeners have kids or are kids in the 10 to 13 range. That, that's I all our listeners. <laughs> no, yeah. it's not. That but could be still. all of them. That, I'm sure I would have listened to this as a 10-year-old. So, um, yeah, Danger Gang and the Pirates of Borneo, Danger Gang and the Isle of Feral Beasts. And the, the third book is called, right now, it's called The Quest for the Ruby-Backed Turtle. Which is Very awesome. cool, man. Well, Steve, thanks for coming. Titles. I'll, I'll make sure that Ethan and my people let you guys know about my morning bowel movement tomorrow so we can do a piece on that. But otherwise, you know, <laughs> yep. thank, thanks for... 2,000 ju- words. That's right. 2,000 words. Do it's, Monday. It's not a big ask, you know. It's just like, it's like what was the consistency, the texture? Just write about it. Um, well, but, uh, <laughs> we absolutely love you, so so I would at least ponder it, which I wouldn't do for most. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thanks for joining us, Steve. I really appreciate it, man. You guys are so great. Thanks for having me. Well, that was awesome. The Mooch is always a treat. He's uh, he's just he's full of stories, man. I I, I love that guy. He's got Great so guest. much to talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the show. The end. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> love that it. is the show. Love you guys. Have a good, good night. Pat's ears look ridiculous. Look at him. He can't hear us. Look at his stupid hat and his dumb face. Should talk about how ugly he is and how long his hair is getting. I hate him. Oh my god.